All right, thank you very much, uh, Dan, and uh, thanks to all of you for joining this session. Um, I, I, I do want to start with a word of thanks also to the organizers of the larger conference just for taking up an important subject and for taking it up in a particular form. Uh, in a conference that lets different people with different ideas express different views, hear each other, consider one another's ideas. The last few years in our politics have uh, been lacking in opportunities for real exchange and conversation. We've had a lot of chances to stand separately and yell, but not a lot of chances to sit together and talk. Uh, and I am grateful uh, to the organizers of this for trying to change that and for involving me in it, um, even if we don't always agree on every point. I've been asked to speak about the question of Edmund Burke and the nation um, and to approach the, the matter of conservatism and nationalism through that path, and I'm very pleased to do that. I think it's worth starting with a brief word about why that subject might matter. Um, Edmund Burke's appeal for contemporary American conservatives is not genealogical. It's not that our political persuasion began with Burke or with somebody reading Burke. Um, and so we should begin there too. It's not self-evident that we should look to him for guidance as we might to the American founders, for example. Burke's appeal, rather, is that he articulates especially clearly a disposition, a set of views and attitudes that's rooted in a set of philosophical premises that have been important to conservative politics and liberal societies since the late 18th century. We didn't always get them from him, but he expresses them unusually well and clearly and this is a time when we could use some clarity on some of the key challenges we face and key ideas we have to work with in our politics. And there's no question that as Burke articulates his vision of things, his view of politics, the nation does turn out to occupy a primary place in that vision. The idea of the nation, of national character and national institution, uh, lurks in the background of almost everything that Burke has to say in one way or another. We might say that his political thought in a lot of respects culminates in a kind of national thought. But it does that in a way that is very far from simple, a way that will tend to affirm some of what now marches under the banner of nationalism, but that also stands as a rebuke to some of it. And I think maybe especially as a rebuke to the tendency to dismiss liberalism and the liberal tradition as a source of wisdom and order and virtue for us. That dismissal is, I think, on the whole a mistake that some people on the right are leaning toward at this point letting a certain kind of progressive own the term liberal, and so allowing our tradition to be identified only with its worst self and rejecting an essential core of our heritage, supposedly in the name of traditionalism. Thinking about Burke and the nation could help us see that a little more clearly uh, and, and, and help us think forward from it. We have to do this very briefly, and so let me suggest to you that Burke's thinking points toward the nation in four distinct ways that all can help us think about what nationalism actually means in our time. The first of these has to do with love of country and its place in politics. The second is about national character. The third is about the nation as the unit of analysis in world affairs. And the fourth is about the nation as the unit of analysis in domestic affairs. I want to quickly speak about each of these four and then suggest how the combination of them could help us to address our confusion around the idea of the national in contemporary American political life. So first and most simply, Burke is very concerned with the love of country. We might say with nationalism as a kind of patriotism, which he takes to be essential to any healthy political life. He thinks this sentiment runs very deep in most people. As Burke put it at the Hastings trial in 1794, quote, next to the love of parents for their children, the strongest instinct, both natural and moral, that exists in man is the love of his country. This is real love. It's a passion more than a reflection. And it's connected to the fact of having grown up around the sights and sounds and smells of a place. The native soil has a sweetness in it beyond a harmony of verse, Burke writes. This kind of patriotism is very visceral. It is literally about soil sometimes. Though it's important to see that it's not about blood. Burke thinks there is a kind of metaphorical connection between blood ties and national ties, but only as a metaphor. Key to the strength of British national feeling, he wrote in 1790, is that, quote, we have given to our frame of polity the image of a relation in blood, binding up the constitution of our country with our dearest domestic ties, adopting our fundamental laws into the bosom of our family affections. Notice the distinction, the image of a relation in blood, not the reality of a relation in blood. The image, and with it a crucial part of the love of country, is achieved by treating our country as a kind of extension of our family, and by seeing it as a source of what we have in common with those with whom we have the most in common. 
It's precisely a way of extending our sense of who we are as a people beyond actual literal family ties. This deep love of country has enormous political significance in Brooks' view. It's crucial to what holds the people together and to why people respect the law and the authority of their government. When the French tried to tear up the sources of this national sentiment and replace them with abstractions about the rights of man, as Burke puts it, they left the law with no support except for the power of the state. And that ended any prospect for a free society in France. Love of country is therefore absolutely necessary for the very freedom of a free society, as he sees it. And yet, the key to this love of our country is not just that the country is ours. To make us love our country, our country ought to be lovely, Burke famously wrote in the Reflections. And what makes it lovely is what he called its distinct system of manners, that is, its ways and habits, its most cherished commitments, or we might say now, its national character. This is the second of Burke's ideas about nationalism that could help us think more clearly that there is such a thing as a national character and that it's somehow at the heart of the life of a nation. That character is a product of common experience formed over history and holding us together in time. It is the sum of the things that we do and believe and something like the nation's personality. A society's political life is an expression of its national character and can only really function as long as it is somehow aligned with that character. This character of the British people constantly arises in Burke's approach to the French Revolution, for instance. He thought the British would not ultimately be tempted by the example of France because, I quote, thanks to the cold sluggishness of, sluggishness of our national character, we still bear the stamp of our forefathers. In other words, national character is particularly important to how Burke thinks about political revolutions and transformations, and not only in France, it's how he understands the events of the Glorious Revolution in Britain. It's how he thinks about the Polish uprising against the Russians and about indigenous uprisings in India. These revolutions, all of which Burke defends and supported, arose in defense of the character of each of these nations against an attack on it. And this is crucial to his thinking about America, too. Burke comes to believe that the Americans should be allowed their independence because he thinks the British have tried to govern them in a way that ignores and insults their national character. As he put it to Parliament, in this character of the Americans, a love of freedom is the predominating feature which marks and distinguishes the whole. A failure to govern people in accordance with its national character is in this sense not only imprudent, but even a kind of injustice. And that was key to what Burke saw happening in France. He says the French Revolution was not a popular uprising in defense of the national character, but a kind of elite coup against it. It was an effort to extinguish the nation through a politics of abstraction imposed on the people by a small minority of radicals. These pretended citizens, Burke writes of the revolutionaries, treat France like a conquered country. They condemn a subdued people and insult their feelings, destroy all vestiges of the ancient country in religion, in polity, in laws, and in manners. Notice that these invaders who would destroy all these vestiges of national character are French. They're not foreigners. Burke several times over his decades of political writing suggests that the character of a nation needs to be defended by the people not just against foreign conquest, but sometimes also from domestic corruption and decadence. And this concern leads Burke to distinguish sometimes between the people and their leaders on the question of national character. The whole of his beloved British constitution, Burke says, has emanated from the simplicity of our national character and from a sort of native plainness and directness of understanding. And he goes on, this disposition still remains, at least in the great body of the people. That last clause might seem a little strange for Burke. We think of him as a defender of the virtues of aristocracy, and he was that. We think of him as skeptical of public passions, and he was that too. But he was also wary of the passions of elites. And in defense against those, Burke believed that the public at large was a kind of great depository of the national character, that the public could be counted on to react when the national character was offended or betrayed, and that on rare occasions such offenses could be so grave as to in fact justify a revolution. In general though, apart from times of revolution, the significance of a people's national character was to distinguish them from other peoples of the world. Distinct national characters mean that ours is a world of distinct nations. And this is the third piece of Brooks' approach to the nation that might be of use to us now. It is, in some respects, the most obvious, of course, and it might strike us as the simplest part of nationalism, but we should see how it's distinct from the other two facets that I've been sketching for you. The idea of the nation is rooted in sentimental attachment 
and in a distinct character in need of defense, but then it roots a certain way of thinking. The nation functions as the unit of analysis in world affairs. This idea is implicit for Burke in a lot of his thinking about global politics, but we see it expressed in an unusually distinct way when he takes up the question of just why the British might want to concern themselves with France. Quote, formerly, your affairs were your own concern only. This is Burke writing to his French correspondent in the Reflections on the Revolution. We felt for them as men, but we kept aloof from them because we're not citizens of France. But when we see the model held up to ourselves, we must feel as Englishmen, and feeling we must provide as Englishmen. Your affairs are, in spite of us, made part of our interest. In this respect, involvement in the internal affairs of foreign nations is a kind of last resort. That's not to say that there's not a higher order to which politics answers even among nations for Burke. While each society is an intergenerational contract, as he famously says, Burke argues that each contract of each particular state is but a clause in the great primeval contract of eternal society. The nation, though, has a distinct place in this great primeval contract for him. And as a result, nations are seen as the units of analysis of world affairs, a world of nations, each with its distinct character and its political forms built up around that character, is the world as Burke sees it. And yet to say that the nation is the organizing principle of world affairs is not to say that the nation is the organizing principle of domestic affairs. Here Burke offers a very distinct and different idea of nationalism that we should be especially careful to notice. This is the fourth and the final facet of Burke's nationalism that I want to draw to your attention. His idea that national attachment is the culmination or the sum of local attachments. This is not the only way to think about nationalism, of course. It's not even the most common way. Modern theorists of nationalism actually consider the French Revolution a great example of nationalist further because it, fervor because it sought to erase local connections in favor of a single strong national identity. Progressive nationalists in early 20th century America thought this way too. When he laid out his new nationalism in 1910, Teddy Roosevelt said, the new nationalism puts the national need before the sectional. It is impatient of the impotence that springs from over-division of governmental powers. This is not Burke's kind of nationalism at all. He reserves maybe his hottest anger against the French for their eradication of local distinction and regional power. The decision of the National Assembly to eliminate the old counties that for so long had composed the French nation and to replace them with perfectly square districts measured in meters strikes Burke as an absolute abomination. He writes, quote, it is boasted that the geometrical policy has been adopted so that all local ideas should be sunk, that the people should be no longer Gascons or Picards, Bretons or Normans, but Frenchmen, with one country, one heart, one assembly. But instead of being all Frenchmen, the greater likelihood is that the inhabitants of these regions will shortly have no country at all. By breaking local attachment, in other words, we only weaken national feeling. The nation is not best understood as one whole to be divided into parts, but as the sum of various uneven, ancient, lovable elements. This has everything to do with Burke's concern for national sentiment and love of country, and with his emphasis on national character. We're prepared for love of country by a love of home. Quote, we begin our public affections in our families. No cold relation is a zealous citizen, he writes. We pass on to our neighborhoods and our habitual provincial connections such divisions of our country as have been formed by habit and not by a sudden jerk of authority were so many little images of the great country in which the heart found something which it could fill. The love to the whole is not extinguished by this subordinate partiality, he writes. Perhaps it is a sort of elemental training to those higher and more large regards by which alone men come to be affected as if with their own concern in the prosperity of a kingdom, end quote. This is not to take away from the significance of the nation, which for Burke runs both deep and high. National attachment is almost mystical. Nation is a moral essence, Burke writes, not a geographical arrangement or a denomination of the nomenclature. But that moral essence is within our reach. It appeals to us as human beings by finding us where we are. We reach our love of country as an extension of our love of our own, and it is what allows us to reach beyond that love of our own and toward the highest goods. This is a rushed and obviously much truncated overview of Burke's thought on this question of national life. But I think that these four parts are the basic elements of how he approached that question. 
And it seems to me, to close, that they also offer us a lot of help in thinking through the question of nationalism in our own time. They suggest, first of all, that nationalism, this term that has been thrown around in ways that have divided conservatives lately, has at least four distinct meanings that we ought to try to keep separate. Nationalism is, for one thing, a sentiment, a love of country that is a form of patriotism, if maybe sometimes with harder edges. Nationalism is also a temperament, another way of speaking of the national character, and which is aroused in particular when that character is offended or threatened or despised, whether by foreigners or by our own elites. It is, in this sense, not so much a form of patriotism as almost a form of populism, protective of an unarticulated identity, inclined to resentment, but intensely loyal. And then, in two respects, nationalism could be understood more as an analytical method, a way of parsing politics, so that nationalism can be thought of as the view that the nation ought to be the basic unit of analysis in foreign affairs or in domestic affairs. The former understands nationalism in opposition to globalism, the latter in opposition to localism. These four facets of nationalism are related, but they are far from identical. And I think today's intra-conservative debates about nationalism tend to confuse and confound them some. I take, for example, my friend Rich Lowry to be articulating a case for nationalism that is ultimately an elevated case for patriotism. My friend Michael Brennan Doherty, in a fantastic recent book, articulates a kind of nationalism that is more like a temperament, defensive of national character. My friend Yoram Hazoni, who brought all of us together, argues in his own excellent recent book for a nationalism that is basically a case for understanding global affairs as describing a world of distinct nations. And we can take many of our friends who are horrified by various calls for nationalism on the right and really listen to them and find that they are horrified by what they take to be an argument for organizing our domestic politics around the national imperative. I think I more or less agree with all of these people, even though they don't think they agree with each other. And the reason is that they seem to mean different things by nationalism, good or bad. Edmund Burke, by drawing some distinctions, can help us see some vital differences. And he also traces what I think is a plausible and healthy conservative nationalism, or national conservatism, which is unabashedly patriotic, is protective of national character, is inclined to think of world affairs in terms of nations, but is insistent also that the internal life of our society is better thought of from the bottom up. And Burke can help us in another way, by pointing to the distinctly liberal character of the American national character in particular. It is essential to realize, as Burke helps us to see, that our country is not an idea, but a society with a character, a culture, a history, full of people who are our real life fellow citizens and to whom we owe practical, material, functional loyalty, day in and day out. And yet there's something ironically universalist in the claim that every nation's character should be equally particularist. Our particular national character, as Burke could see even before American independence, is uniquely oriented by certain principled commitments. For Americans in particular, the appeal of the national can be both philosophical and visceral, because we share a common home in which we've lived a common life together that has always been committed to a set of ideals, religious or philosophical, communal and liberal, including a belief in natural rights rooted in natural equality, pointing to a politics of justice. Our national commitments add up to a people born and bred to seek freedom and virtue together. Oversimplifying these commitments so that we leave ourselves a choice between an America of pure liberal abstraction or one that is wholly divorced from all universal ideals is not, I think, the right way to understand America or to conserve it. It even threatens sometimes to devolve into a nationalism rooted in race, which certainly no legitimate American nationalism would ever allow itself to become. And it oversimplifies somewhat the liberal tradition itself. The idea that liberalism is just radical individualism backed with state power is, I think, a caricature, concocted first by those who viewed that kind of combination as a dream, and then strangely adopted by some of those who see it as a nightmare. Liberalism has always been much more than that, and some liberals have always been aware of the danger of emptying the public square of moral substance and of the importance of sustaining the liberal society's pre-liberal roots so that it doesn't lose sight of the highest good. I think Edmund Burke is one of those. And finally, Burke's distinct teaching on the nation can offer us one further lesson. Our politics is a national politics which means that it's an argument among people who share a national character, who owe each other something. Those with whom we disagree in our society are not our enemies. They are our neighbors. They're not out to harm our country. 
They differ with us about what would be good for it. And to love our country is to love them too, even when they go out of their way to make it very, very hard to do that. The larger society to which they try to speak and we try to st speak is the depository of our national character and our national good sense. And we should all try to be cheered by that thought, to be grateful for the extraordinary good fortune that we have and for the glorious, wonderful fact that we all get to be Americans together. Thank you.